Well, hello everyone and a special greeting to all of you in the King's Church International Family meeting at the showgrounds in Robertson, South Africa and at the Theatre Royal in Windsor. Today we start a new series called Discovering the Real Jesus. Jesus Christ is like no one else who ever lived. He is the central personality of history, dividing history into time before Christ and after Christ. John Young, in his book Christianity, writes this, Jesus has been the focus of more study, more controversy, and more art than any other figure. In today's world, millions of people from every continent and nearly every country claim some allegiance to him. Christians make up about one third, well actually it's over that now, of the world's population. Now today, of course, so many people know about Jesus, including, no doubt, most of you, the listeners today. But do we really know who Jesus is? Do we have good reason to believe in him? And not least, does our belief actually change our lives for good? Does it make a, a significant difference to our lives? And are we more alive and confident of the hope of eternal life? Well, today and over the coming weeks, we will be looking at answers to these very, very important questions as we focus on the book of John, the fourth gospel after Matthew, Mark and Luke. John wanted everyone to know that Jesus was unlike anyone else. In fact, in this first chapter of John, he refers to him twice in verses 14 and 18 as the one and only, nobody like Jesus. And John stated very clearly his reason for writing this gospel. He said it was, quote, written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. That's what he said at uh, John 20, uh, 31. He was very intentional when he wrote this book of 21 chapters. He was not just recording a history of Jesus. The stories, the miracles, the parables of Jesus that John selected had a very specific goal in mind. And that was that at the end of reading, you wouldn't just finish the gospel and say, well, that was a very nice book. No, it was written that you may believe, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. Actually, uh, the full meaning from the Greek, uh, the present continuous, as they call it, means that these are written that you may go on believing that Jesus was the Son of God, and by going on believing, you will go on having eternal life. God wants to change your life both now and forever. And this book of John can open up the possibility of this to each one of us. It was through reading and studying this book that a famous United Kingdom actor came to faith in Jesus. And he also became part of our church family many years ago. His name was John French. He had been very angry when his beautiful actress fiancée became a Christian after hearing Billy Graham preach in London. And so he, he contacted a photographer at the Daily Mirror National Newspaper so that he could catch the moment on camera when he would confront Billy Graham and just punch him in the mouth. Well, the moment came, but quickly Billy Graham grabbed his hand and started shaking it as if John French was an old friend of his. And the photographer got a very different uh, shot than the one that he was expecting. And John French ended up asking Billy Graham to tell him how he could discover Jesus for himself. Billy Graham told him to read right through John's Gospel. Well, the actor read it, read his script, he used to read in scripts. He, he read through this and he came back to Billy Graham and he said, it hasn't made any difference to me at all. What do I do now? Billy Graham said, read it again. 
Well, he read it again. He contacted Billy Graham again. Same thing. Billy said, just keep on reading. And then Billy got a call from John French saying that there was a moment when he was just reading through when everything changed. He said it was like a light came on and suddenly he believed that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And from that moment, his whole life changed. And John French, too, actually became an evangelist. So John's Gospel is a very revolutionary book. But who is the writer of this fourth gospel, this gospel that has power to bring us to faith in Christ? Well, different scholars have come up with their own speculations and pet theories, but there are many good reasons to believe that John's gospel was written by John the Apostle, the fisherman son of Zebedee. John was part of the inner circle of disciples along with his brother James and Peter. John was the closest and the last surviving disciple of Jesus. John was with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry and he was there at the cross when Jesus asked him from the cross to look after his mother Mary. John knew from first-hand experience that Jesus was far more than a good man or even a miracle worker, but he was and is actually the Son of God. And at one time he didn't know that, but then everything he witnessed showed him that Jesus really was who he claimed to be. And so he became not only a believer, but he went on to become part of the world-changing, history-making group of 12 disciples. So no wonder John wanted to tell everyone who Jesus really is. Now, in his introduction, which we're looking at uh, this week in John 1, 1 to 18, he lays a strong foundation about the uniqueness of Christ. And it's important that you um, read uh, this for yourself and read through John's gospel uh, over the coming weeks. We've already had some of this reading, so do your best to read and study for yourself. Now, I'm going to pick out some key points from this passage. So... Here we go. Number one, Jesus is the God of both eternity and time. John 1, 1 to 3 says this, in the beginning was the word. Now this is very similar to the account of Genesis, of course. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Put simply, Jesus existed long, long, long before he appeared on earth. He was right there at the beginning of time and before time. He is the God who created everything. It is through Jesus that the whole universe came into being. As Colossians 1.16 puts it like this, For in him all things were created things in heaven on and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, Jesus was the name given when he came to earth. Matthew 21 says this, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So what was he called before then? Well, John calls him the Logos or the Word as it is translated in most of our Bible versions. John was trying to communicate to both Jews and non-Jews and he's regarded as finding a very brilliant way to do this by referring to Christ uh, as the Word. For the Jews, they would remember the words of God in creation and how the prophets were always declaring the word of the Lord. For Greek readers, the word was associated with the search for the meaning of life. So John was connecting uh, both groups, if you like, and, sp and speaking to them in a way that they could find their own applications and saying, this is the one that the scriptures have spoken of, and this is the one you've all been searching for. So Jesus was God at the beginning, and he is God 
today. And then in a moment of time, the eternal, timeless God stepped into time. And as verse 14 says, he made his dwelling among us. Now, this is a very big uh, thing to understand and so, so powerful. Secondly, Jesus is God who is both fully divine and fully human. It says the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. So Jesus is both the God of glory, the one and only son who came from the father and also the one who lived as a human being. He was not more divine than he was human, or more human than he was divine, or partly divine and partly human. You still with me? Think about this. He was both physical and spiritual, earthly and heavenly, fully human and fully divine. Now, John's gospel, perhaps more than other gospels, portrays Jesus as very human. For example, recording. Uh, in the shortest verse in the Bible, one I used to love to remember in Sunday school, what's your memory verse? Was it? Jesus wept. Yes, Jesus wept. But in saying that, John was getting something very special across, that Jesus feels deeply, and he felt the death of about Lazarus very deeply, so Jesus wept. He writes of how Jesus was hungry and thirsty and tired and felt his constant need to pray and have the help and the wisdom as a father. But John also emphasizes equally the divinity of Jesus, the divine nature of Jesus, that Jesus, in fact, claimed for himself in what is called the seven I am's, which we'll look at later on in this series, and in the seven miracles that he records that are signs of Jesus being God. Now, there are very real consequences for us to understand that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine. Don't think this is just some theological teaching here. It's very, very important. For because of this, we can be forgiven because he alone is the unique bridge, the only bridge between sinful people and a holy God. And because of this, we don't have to think of God as just someone who's far off, but someone who comes very near and who has come near into our world to help us in every battle that we face. And he is able, the Bible says, to sympathize, to empathize with us in our weaknesses. Hebrews 4, 15, verse 16 says this, for we have one who has been tempted in every way, think about that, as we are yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Also, this discovery that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine will help us to live balanced, well-adjusted lives as Christians. We won't become so so-called super spiritual and mystical and heavenly minded that we don't care about the state of the world that we live in and the very real needs of so many people living in this world. Neither will we get caught up in practical good works of Christianity at the expense of our spiritual development. And nor will we divide our lives into the sacred and the secular between, if you like, church life and everyday life. The real Jesus, understanding who Jesus really is, will help us to live real lives in a real way with real people in the real world with the real God and for God. Okay, now thirdly, moving quickly on, the real Jesus is the God who is both full of grace and truth. It says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only, uh, the one and only who came from the Father. Listen to this, it goes on to say, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he 
who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and who is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Now, Jesus was the perfect combination of grace and truth. So often people say, I just want to be a person of grace. Doesn't matter what the Bible teaches about anything, just I want to be grace and loving. And others say, no, we just need the truth. We need the truth. And don't go soft to all this compassion stuff. Jesus came for sure to uphold and to fulfill the law and the commandments of God. But he also showed mercy to those who broke those very commandments. Once there was a conference on world religions and academics were debating if there was any belief that was unique to Christianity. And C.S. Lewis uh, came in, the great writer and academic, he came and he heard them arguing. So they asked him, what, if anything, is unique about the Christian faith? And C.S. Lewis said, that, that's easy, it's grace. What drew people to Jesus? He said, well, his knowledge, his wisdom, his teaching, his miracles. Of course, all these did. But something else and very different stood out about Jesus. And that was his grace and his compassion to people who didn't deserve it, actually. He befriended despised tax collectors and sinners. He offered forgiveness, not condemnation, to the woman caught in the act of adultery. And because of his great mercy, he gave his life for undeserved sinners to pay the price for all of us who have sinned and come short of God's glory. Now, if we're going to show the real Jesus in our world, we too must be very clear in our commitment to the teachings and to the standards of scriptures and to the realities that all have sinned and face the judgment of God. But we must be equally loud and clear in our communication of the message of salvation and reject harsh, self-righteous religion that is full of accusation and damnation. Full of grace and truth, are we? Are we full of some, half and half? No, we need to be full of truth and we need to be full of grace. Uh, fine, my final point today is Jesus is the God who offers light and life to all who receive him. Verse 4 says, in him was life and that life was the light of men. So when the light shone in the world, it brought life and everything came to life. So we can too have a full life when we know the life, uh, when we have the light of God in our heart. Verses five to nine continue to declare that Jesus is the true light who overcomes all darkness and evil. When the light of Christ is there, darkness cannot stay, it has to go. And when his light really shines on us, we really can begin to live. We can really experience and enjoy life. But we must choose to receive this light and not continue to live in the dark, darkness, lives of moral and spiritual darkness. John 1, 10 to 13 says of Jesus that he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Today, if you will receive Jesus, you too can experience his light and his life. Let's pray. So while every head is bowed, just take a moment. This teaching needs unpacking and it needs applying in our hearts. It's so, so significant. We need to understand who Jesus really is. Today, you may know about Jesus, but do you really know him? 
Have you received his forgiveness? You know that you have been forgiven by God. The kiss of his mercy, if you like. Have you received that? Do you know you're loved by God? Well, today you can if you are ready to receive him. And if you wish to, then please pray this prayer with me. Look, you can pray your prayers in your own way, in your own words, but this, this is not a, like a customized prayer, but something that may help you to just formulate what you feel. Let's pray now, please. Wherever you are, whatever nation you're in, whether you're in the theater or the showground, maybe you could all pray out loud to, to, together here. Maybe you're just watching from China or Russia, America, places where we know people are now viewing these programs. Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and I want to receive new life. Please forgive me for all the sins I have committed and for all the times that I have walked in darkness. Please come now, Lord, and shine your light on me and help me to always keep on believing and to keep on receiving your life as I follow you. Amen. Well, I want to tell you, God hears prayers like that. And when we pray from our heart, he will receive us Imagine that, into his family, that we too can join the great, great, vast numbers of people who are called the children of God. Please contact us if you uh, would like to, because we would like to encourage you how to grow as a, as a Christian by reading your Bible each day. Reading through John's Gospel is a great way to start, uh, of course, to pray in your own words to, to the Lord to be part of a church family, to tell other people you've become uh, a Christian. And uh, the Lord uh, will establish you. You'll be amazed as you, as you grow in the right way, feeding, if you like, with the right food every day, spiritual food, how you will grow in your faith and the Holy Spirit will help you. So stay in contact with us and, and if you wish, join uh, one of the life classes we run for uh, new Christians. Before I go, I'd like to pray for those of you who are Christians. You do know God, you do love God, you serve God in fact, but maybe today you realize that you're in need of what is called a grace awakening. You need to be full of grace. Maybe you're full of truth, but you need to be, have more grace. More grace with your children, more grace with your husband, your wife, um, at work, whatever it is. Maybe you need to have more of the truth of God in you. Anyway, if you would like for the Lord to touch you in a new way, would you just bow your heads also and let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not orphans because the Holy Spirit has come to us to make Jesus real to us. Please today, Lord, I pray that you will come to those who need to be freed from fear, maybe guilt and condemnation. Please, Lord, free people from a pressure to conform, to, to um, be controlling in different situations where they feel they're, they're always in performance mode, Lord. Let them know that when they have repented that you have forgiven them. May they feel the joy of forgiveness. May they be healed in their hearts from any wounds of the past. And I pray you will flood each one with your unconditional love and I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you wherever you are.